Welcome to the Vortex Nation podcast brought to you by lovers of hunting, shooting, public lands, the Second Amendment, and good food. All right, what's up, everybody? Got a good one here for you. We are sitting down with Wisconsin native, outdoor columnist, former magazine editor for several different publications, our very own, I say our very own because we're in Wisconsin, Pat Durkin. So I like that. I like that you're saying our very own now, and you're from Washington. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you got me. That we did. Starting to feel like home, Jim. That's Starting to feel like home. Excellent. So. But, uh, but yeah, so we just wrapped up a, a bit of a, a squirrel hunt this morning, more of a squirrel jaunt. Pat rolled into town, and uh, we kind of had uh, carved out a few hours to go uh, patrol some of the, the bluff country around here that's not too far from the office. We were just talking about, you know, admitting when you don't know something. I consider myself far from a squirrel hunter. I thought, okay. I'll be honest, when we kind of went into it this morning, I was... Uh, I had expectations that it would be the, uh, well, not that you can always catch bluegills all the time either, but it would be, it'd be kind of like the bluegills of hunting. We'd go traipse around the woods a little bit. I mean, not, not you know, be quiet, but uh, I thought there'd be a little more action. All I could think about was that dove hunt from like a year ago where it was like, oh, dude, this spot is a shoe in We're going to just be hammering doves. Just a Did lot. Did not see one dove. Then, actually... No, we did see one dove at the end, and we had to climb up an entire quarry side for it. And then I thought about a hog hunt I went on, where we went up in a helicopter, and they were like, for sure, when you're in a chopper, you just <laughs> slam. <laughs> Shot one. And then today, Mark was really talking up the squirrel spot, and we saw one, but... It looks so good. Yeah. We anyway. came close. We came close. We came Pat, close. You're, you're probably definitely more of a small game hunter than I am, you know? But yeah. So, I mean, let's, historically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like we were talking a, a little bit ago, just kind of like growing up and, and small game hunting and just how that was kind of how most people started well, hunting and, and kind of more common. Definitely. Perhaps. Yeah. The, well, like the area we're hunting today for squirrels is really close to where I grew up deer hunting. But in those days, I'm talking about the late 60s, early 70s. No one that I knew back then deer hunted as a as a primary hunting activity. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was something you put away the, you got your deer rifle, you had you had a deer rifle, and that was it. And then you had all these different you know twenty twos and shotguns for rabbits and squirrels. And I always liken it to um, when you when you're a little kid, you this little progression you go up and you play. We didn't have tee ball back then, but we had you know like basically what little kids could do to hit a hard ball. And then you, get, you go from the little city league and neighborhood games to a city league, and then the, the better kids went on the little league. There's always this progression, and that's kind of how we did hunting. You know, we started off squirrel hunting, and as you got better and your dad would allow, well, eventually you'd go deer hunting, but it still wasn't the focus that deer hunting became. Mm-hmm. You know, really now, mm-hmm. it's not uncommon now. It's for, common now for kids for the first thing they hunt and the first thing they shoot to be deer. Mm -hmm. That just didn't happen. It wasn't how we did things, you know. It's interesting. Yeah. Huh. But I think, I'm prejudiced, of course, because that's how I did it, but I just think, I think that makes you a better hunter overall when you kind of, when you're out there shooting all the time on a regular basis anyway and and sneaking around, learning to just sit still. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. because, you know, the one thing you learn in squirrel hunting too is is still you got to be quiet. You got to be still. At least I had my best hunting that way. And then rabbit hunting, though, was more of a social thing. You'd, you would walk around. You would make noise. Right. And then uh, I, was, I was telling Jim today, I said, so often at squirrel hunting, we'd come to these spots. You'd sit for a little bit. And it seemed like the time you're sitting there, you, without realizing it, you were making some squirrel 15 yards away very nervous. You weren't even aware it was there. Mm-hmm. But then as soon as you would kind of back off a little bit, all of a sudden that squirrel would show itself. It's like, here's my chance to get away. And, and off it'd go. And, but I think you'd, without knowing it, you basically had psyched them out. And they now felt they better get out of here. Yeah. Well, that's what happened when we were on that last squirrel in a way. Yeah. Because there was one squirrel at the end where finally when we found a squirrel, Mark took a shot at it up in the tree and missed it. It was a tough shot because the squirrel was basically prone on this branch trying to blend in. And the uh, squirrel came down, sprinted down the tree, and we didn't get it on its way down. And then we all thought it went way off in one direction to the point of no return. But right, it, as right. we were looking far in the distance, all of a sudden we stopped walking, and about 15, 20 seconds later when we were very still, 
it shot out of a tree like 10 feet away from us. Yeah. That was its tactic, to stay really close or something. So, and, so it, yeah. was on, it was on a tree. It was back up in a tree it was, when you saw it. When I saw it shoot away, it was at the base of a tree. Okay. It was in like almost like a fork where the tree was splitting yeah. really close to the ground. Yeah. It was in a bunch of brush and fallen leaves down there. It was just completely still. And then once we went completely still for a while, it was like, this is my chance. Yep. Yeah, I thought he was. I thought he was long gone, and actually, I was just, uh, you know, just counting our blessings because I thought Pat was a goner there for a minute when he came charging down that tree and then <laughs> basically ran through Pat. So but, straight um, at him, yeah. That that was an interesting scroll tactic. I felt was, you know, that wasn't the run away. That was the run at. Yeah, he he made a head-on shot at me, and I missed him three times right, <laughs> right at my feet, basically <laughs> shooting yeah. shooting in the ground and. It was kind of embarrassing, but I felt almost like I was shooting in self-defense, which then you don't hit anything. <laughs> and, right. And, yeah, yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty wacky. The well, thing I, was, I was more really. I was more scared that I, I scared you guys at that point because I thought, God, I don't think I was aiming at them. But I, went, I walked over and looked. Through, I actually found two of the three shots where it hit. One hit into the log, and one hit into the the dirt. Yeah. Right there, and I thought, well, okay, I was pointing down. Oh in, yeah, in, yeah. Into the. You definitely. But still, were. it. Those things flash through your mind, though. I think, God, that was a little scary, you mm-hmm. know? What was fun about that, though, he got past me. I never did hear him go dashing off through the leaves. It was like, I thought, God, he seemed like he had to have stopped right over here. Right. Mm-hmm. And then when you saw him or heard him, I'm pretty sure I heard him come, come off and into the leaves, but that, all I heard was that one bound, and I saw you reacting. I thought, yeah, it must have been the squirrel. I ran after him. When I was going after him, I decided to not go too far because it seemed like every time you spooked them, they didn't go as far as you thought. The first time, Mark, you saw that squirrel, and it ran off. Yeah, I and saw And we thought it was, again, long gone. And then all of a sudden, Pat, luckily had seen it, whiz up a tree mm-hmm. that we were standing right next to. Yeah. And then it was, and then you took the shot at it in the tree, and again, it ran to the bottom of the tree, and it ended up being not far again. And then when it ran this, the third time, I was like, man, I'm not going to go very far for this thing. I feel like it's going to be right here. Yeah, that was pretty crazy because when I first saw it, it was on the ground and kind of bounded to my right, and, and I thought it kept going. But like you said, Pat saw it jump up in that tree and then didn't see it leave that tree. Uh, there was enough space between it and the two adjacent trees. And finally, I got... Well, the binoculars. Yeah. yeah. I grabbed oh, yeah. the binos, and I was, I'll say it. I was tearing that tree apart. It reminded me of like what I've heard of sooty grouse uh, yeah. hunting. Yeah, I've never been. I watched, you know, the Meat Eater special and I listened to the podcast. They talked about those things where, you know, granted, we're not searching for like a woo woo sound. Right. We're searching for a squirrel up mm-hmm. in a tree and you just ended up taking that shot almost pointed straight up. Yeah, like you said, he was laid up probably, you know, the tallest branch about in the tree. It was about the diameter of his body, the squirrel diameter. And uh, he was just laying as flat as he could to it. And his head was just turned to the right a little bit and he moved it. Just a little bit where I thought I might be able to, you know, get a decent shot in there. And, and uh, it was about straight up, you know, oh, yeah. almost. And, Very steep uh, angle. I yeah. guess, you know, came close enough to... Unfortunately, pulling the trigger on one of those old 1022s is like, I don't know. I, I can't even describe how not good it is. <laughs> They're an awesome rifle for plinking, general use. But um, I, I was frustrated, not, not just by the trigger, but like I was actually... Uh, in, not frustrated. I was inspired... Mm-hmm. by today's events and actually how challenging the squirrel hunting actually was and almost the lack of... I'm almost glad that we didn't get into the squirrels today. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because Let's now now I'm, like I said, I'm inspired take seriously to, now. to take it a lot more seriously. And I probably was naive to not take it as seriously as I probably should have this morning. That's the thing that's kind of fun about hunting and fishing too is that beginners a lot of times... They're, they're so e- easily frustrated where they don't think there's even a hope of, of anything happening. The more you hunt, the more you fish, the more you have these times that drag out like that where you're walking and nothing's happening. You've had enough experience now hunting over the years, though, where, you, where it almost gets to be really personal. Right. You know, that I'm going to figure this out. There's squirrel nests around here. There's got to be squirrels around. We're not going to quit until we get something done here. Yeah. And I could sense that in you today. It's like, okay. <laughs> we're not done yet. <laughs> no, we yeah. are we are far from done. And you know, and and part of that is um like in the coming weeks, I'm going to learn everything that I can about squirrels, squirrel behavior, squirrel it's habitat, a new challenge. their diets. Mm-hmm. It's a new challenge. And you know, along with that, you know, I'm going to up my gear, but I think part of my probably over 
I mean, I didn't think we were going to shoot 100 squirrels today. No. Not that we would, right? You know? But when you deer hunt, it seems like there's always squirrels around. And it's almost more of a, because you're, you're so hyper-focused on deer, like you hear that squirrel, and like, oh, it's just a squirrel, you know? And now I, after, you know, chasing them with intent today, I'm like, man, I'm not, yeah. I should have been giving these guys the time of day when they're all around. But they seem yeah. like they're all around, but they're not. It, to your point, too, like figuring out what it is about their habitat, I, I'd be very curious because when we found that last, that well, I shouldn't say that last, that one squirrel. The first and last. The, the first and last. It was near like, there were like three squirrel nests right in that small area, wasn't mm-hmm. there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It almost makes you wonder, too. If three the reason, for sure. If the reason it charged you was, <laughs> you know, maybe they're more aggressive when they're around that. I, I don't know really much about squirrels. <laughs> well, I, I think typically my experience is that they know where they're going at some point. When they, mm-hmm. when they really think they got to get out of here and get somewhere, they have something in mind. And he probably, but then again, if we stopped there right behind the tree that, we were, that I was next to, he was basically right around the other side of it. Mm-hmm. What'd you say, Jim? It was, it was either, it was either a, a JV move or a varsity move? Or yeah, what'd that's you say? right. I said it was either a junior uh, tactic or a senior tactic. <laughs> yeah, Who knows? Yeah. Either he was uh, just stupid enough to work or he was really, really smart. <laughs> either, either way, it worked out in his favor. Yeah. Fun morning, though. I got to say, man, if we could have gone to my neighborhood, in, which is, is fairly in the city, we would have been in some dang good squirrel territory. In fact, I had eight squirrels living in my attic. When I first moved into uh, my wife and I first moved into our home, that's they, right. Um, there's a squirrel nest. I no kidding. In the maple tree in our front yard, there's two giant old maple trees. In one of them, there's a squirrel nest way, way, way at the top. And one of them decided to come on down, climb up the side of my house because we have a brick house, and then chew a baseball-sized hole in this like attic vent. Crawled in there, made a little family, seven or eight of them. I don't remember. And uh, that was where they lived until we trapped them and got rid of them. What, was there a spot of rotten wood there or something that he started it working was like or... uh, It was kind of like a crummy composite material. They, they told me, the guy who ended up trapping the squirrels told me it was like a, almost like styrofoam, but they coated it in a very, very thin coating. Or, hmm. or there's like a thin layer of maybe peanut aluminum butter or something. Yeah, peanut butter. Might as well have been because they chewed through it like it. But yeah, I used to go out and have stare downs with them. They'd peek out of the little <laughs> hole and stare at me. I wanted so badly to just shoot at my own house. <laughs> <laughs> Better judgment told me otherwise. Well, and you were because you and you hadn't moved into your house at that point. I think while while uh, no, not yet. It was about a week before that. Nice gentleman was running running the trap line there, and you actually you ran into a little bit of neighborly discontent. With the yes, trapping animal that was going control on. was called. Yes. Now we're in the city of Madison, right? Mark, and and. There's some there's some things about the city of Madison that are are maybe uh, a little bit different from from other places. A lot of folks probably aren't used to people running trap lines at their house. Yeah, yeah. And uh, animal control was called, but they determined that it was actually okay. <laughs> the squirrels were not dying in the trap. Huh. Somebody actually noticed this. That- yeah, because it was on the roof, and yeah, the squirrels got trapped, and they were up there for I think about. Five to six hours. They thought that the squirrels were Oh, dying. I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, we're yeah, all good now. Well, not to go way off the path, but uh, it, for me, this is interesting because I grew up in Madison. I think yeah. if you're talking yeah. about squirrels, like it's just natural to go off the path. Okay. <laughs> it, it, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, when I grew up in Madison, this is um, the 60s, early 70s. Then I moved um, in 1975 when I went, went to the Navy. I was gone. I haven't, I haven't lived there since. What you're talking, I'm thinking... It really is a different city from what I grew up in because when I was here all those years ago, 45 years ago, it was common for people to hang deer in their backyard, you know, during deer season. You know, we didn't kill as many deer back then as we do now. Mm-hmm. But I was talking to Mark earlier, so I used to walk out behind our house and walk all the way to Middleton. Those are our tracks all the way out there, rabbits and squirrels come all the way back. And once in a while, somebody had, if you shot near a home, once in a while, somebody had come out and kind of give you the eyeball, like, what are you doing <laughs> and making sure that you weren't shooting in their direction. Right. But typically, the people have kind of accepted it. And hunting with a bow and arrow on those tracks as a kid for rabbits, no one ever questioned you. It was just common, you know. So it's, it, it is, it's a different city in that, in that half century. I li- yeah, and I live in the kind of the older, older part of it. And you can tell that there's kind of like a half and half. Like, there's definitely some folks there that are still, I think, probably a little bit like that. But I think some of the newer, newer folks that have moved in. Maybe not so much. I don't know. Yeah. 
I don't, what do you think, Pat? Because I know, like, personally, growing up, chasing, uh, you know, black-tailed deer, Roosevelt elk, and rough grouse and, and blue grouse, you know, and, and oftentimes the rough grouse, we'd make a couple trips every year, you know, to, uh, to chase those, you know, specifically, but oftentimes they were, like, incidental while you're, you know, deer or elk hunting. And now you grew up doing a lot of small game hunting. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that that's something that people are doing less of now? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You look at any kind of license sales, I think almost any state in the country, I haven't analyzed the South. I know in Wisconsin, small game license really, really have plunged, you know, in the last two decades, especially. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you feel like you're living now in my 60s now. So at times I feel like I'm living in the future. We talked about in my early days, you know, in the newspaper business. And back in the 80s, you know, already back then, wildlife agencies like the Wisconsin DNR, they were looking at license sales trends mm-hmm. and the baby boomer population, who's coming up behind it, are the baby boomers producing hunters, all, like, all those kind of things that we now are experiencing. And this is basically what they predicted back in the late 80s already, that they, the sociologists kind of know their stuff. Mm-hmm. And but that was one of the big concerns is that. During the 80s, as deer hunting boomed, it started, mm-hmm. the, it started like in the mid-70s, late 70s, our deer population in Wisconsin and much of the country mm-hmm. just started skyrocketing. And no one's ever really been able to say for certain why that happened on such a wide-scale basis. Okay, right. I mean, there were some, in the, everyone thinks it's all about where they live at the moment, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and back then in Wisconsin, everyone assumed the reason the deer herd was booming in Wisconsin is because they had tightened the poaching laws, which they had. Okay. But, but there's also other factors like the, the farmers were going much more to the idea of not having cattle grazing in the woods anymore. They're fencing them in the pastures and, and then oh. also bringing alfalfa into them and not having them all over the place all the time. So the, the forest, I mean, the wood, woodlands got better habitat for deer. The cows weren't in the, in the woods as much as they used to be. So there's all those kind of factors. But then you think, okay, that's Wisconsin. But then it was also booming the herds were booming in the south for the first time, really, in, in the history of our country almost. You know, once, once the pioneer came across and they, well, the deer, our habitats were clear-cut, all those kind of things. There's no deer habitat. That south really whacked their deer. There was only, like, what they say back in the turn of the century of the 1900s, they figured we had maybe um, a half million deer nationwide. Right. And now we have about 30 million. So there, there was this big boom. Jeez. Anyway, so, but while I heard boomed, Small game just started trickling away because you, could, you had such abundance of deer that once you start giving out extra permits for deer, yeah, because when I was growing up, you got the one buck tag and that was it. Right. And then, then we had this thing called party permits where four guys would pool their licenses to get one antlerless tag. You know, for like Iowa County out here where we were this morning, you'd have, you'd have to have one guy wear, wear an armband and he was the one who was entitled to shoot the doe if, if, he, if he came across a doe. Of course, they group hunted, but it wasn't legal back then, but everyone did it. Right. But, you know, but as it happened, as the permits started loosening up for deer, all the interest in small games started plummeting. Plus, bow hunting took off. You know, bow hunting wasn't that big in, until the compound bow came was, along and tree stands yeah, came along. Yeah. yeah. And so all those kind of things kind of came together, and all of a sudden, small game hunting this wasn't as popular anymore. So It is interesting. I mean, there's the deer thing, and it definitely has... I feel like people get, you know, they get very excited about deer because it's just, it's bigger. Yeah. It's a big, it feels like a bigger payoff when right. you, know, you get something like that. And maybe, yeah, it's hard to say, like putting all the work in for something so small just doesn't seem as appealing right. these days or what. And, and there are those days, Mark, I can assure you that where you, you have your good days and bad days. Today we had a, I'd say a, a bad day. Right. But there's other days you go out and everything just falls into place. You know, that squirrels yeah. are active, whatever it might be. I, I remember one day. When I was 16, 17 years old, we were all driving by that time. But I remember we went out that day and I had one of those banner days where the limit was five squirrels, but I had two or three buddies with me. And I had one of those days where they told me, keep shooting. We would, you know, group hunt. And I remember, I remember that one day I shot nine squirrels with the 22. No kidding. And then we all went home and, you know, pooled our resources, cleaned them all up and divided the meat up. And, you know, it was really one of those days you never forgot because everything just... I couldn't miss that day. I, I kept, kept stumbling in the squirrels every time I turned around, it seemed. <laughs> you know, so it does happen. That's awesome. You know, and I, yeah, I hadn't thought about it from not necessarily like, a, I guess in the end, you know, you're, you're picking, right? So maybe you're picking one thing that you find, you know, more interesting than the other, but you know, not necessarily a lack of interest, but like more of a, an availability of a, what would be considered a more interesting or desirable thing like deer, you know? I mean, because yeah. you do hear stories like, you know, 
some states where deer are, you know, their their premier deer states were not that long ago. It was a big oh, deal definitely. when somebody cut a track. Oh, in southern Wisconsin was like that. I mean, you still hear guys my age and older talk about how, you know, when they were growing up, it was, it was news when somebody saw a deer somewhere. Yeah. And that wasn't uncommon at all. So, you know, the, to me, when I hear those stories now, I think everyone has one of those stories. You know, come on, this is, <laughs> who hasn't heard that story? Right. You know? But but as time went on, of course, it, like you're saying, when you have that kind of abundance, mm-hmm. and they're, they're a big animal, they're a pretty animal, they're elusive. You know, I was thinking today when we were walking around, we were, we'd stop and look at rubs when we were squirrel hunting. Mm-hmm. When we, were, we were squirrel hunting, but we're still thinking deer. And I was thinking, when I was a kid, and we were first deer hunting, we didn't have any deer hunting tactics. We didn't hunt, like Greg Miller came up with that idea of rub lines, hunting rub lines, finding a line of rubs right. through the tree, through the woods, and thinking, well, Buck, if he made that one rub line one time, he might come through here again on a regular basis. Yeah. And then Greg wrote a great book about it in the mid-90s. I think it was called Rub Line Secrets. And um, I think he said at the end of that book, it was a really one of the better how-to books you can find. But Greg said, having said all this about hunting rub lines, it's only happened to me about six times in my life where it, I've gotten bucks off those rub lines. So it doesn't, right. it doesn't happen very often. It's like musky fishing. You cast 10,000 casts to get that one musky. Yep. Hmm. And, but, you know, we didn't have tactics. We didn't ha- think about hunting over scrapes that much. You're just starting to become aware of that kind of stuff, you know, in the mid-70s where you had these little tactics start coming upward. Because you didn't have, vi- you didn't have videos back then. And typically the way you shared information was you go to a seminar Right. And some local guy who was a pretty good bow hunter would give a seminar and something and old slideshows and stuff. And that's kind of how we shared information. Yeah, it's, yeah share it talking or, yeah. or read an article by a hell of an outdoor columnist. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Well, it, it's just, to me, it's just cool to think about how far deer hunting has come, the tactics, tactics involved. And because, you know, when we first started bow hunting, we did the same things we did during gun season. We'd, we'd sit for a couple hours and just start stumbling around the woods and, Tried doing a little drives and mm-hmm. and I think I don't think anyone tr- tries driving deer the bow and arrow anymore right. and and it's just kind of frowned upon and probably for good reason it's just not yeah. even with guns it's not really uh, the safest thing you can do and it's not the best thing for um, putting lead in there just at running targets all the time sure, sure. so you know but you're, that's all we knew though so that's what we did well that's just it I mean it was new and you're trying to figure trying to figure it out you know and you you kind of sort that stuff out along the way you try things some things work some things don't work and that's one thing that stood out to me as we were walking through the woods. You know, we'd been talking about this. Oh, you know, let's go we'll do a small game hunt. It'll be, you know, you know, fun and casual and light. And, you know, hopefully we'll shoot some squirrels. But it really didn't occur to me until we got into the woods. And, and partially because we really weren't seeing much right. of anything. I'm like, man, I don't, you know, we're talking about tactics. I'm like, I don't really have any squirrel tactics. Yeah. I've got some general hunting <laughs> tactics that I, I plan on implementing today. Like, you know, walk slow, be quiet, sit, wait, listen, you know, which mm-hmm. I think those are a lot of things that probably go into squirrel hunting. Mark, but your sit, wait, and listen was pretty pretty abysmal on the first spot. I mean, we sat, <laughs> for the listeners out there, let's just explain. And it's fine, Mark. It's it's cool. We sat down. I think we were down for about five minutes. And Mark was like, ah, we just got to go. We got to go to the next spot. I was I was antsy to continue exploring the piece of public that we we're on. Cause I almost felt the tension in the air as soon as we sat down and looked out for about five seconds and didn't <laughs> see a squirrel. I, I, could almost, I could almost feel the tension coming over from Mark on the other side of the tree. <laughs> Re- results oriented. Usually, yes. usually, you know, but we talk about deer hunting. Like, I could, that's, I'll sit all day. Sure. Daylight to dark with, with that confidence that, you know, Something can happen. Not that it's not guaranteed right. or anything like that, but you kind of, yeah. where I, I didn't necessarily have that time. Like, well, like you say, you're new at it, so you didn't, you had nothing really to fall back on as, you know. And that was kind of how, when I hunted squirrels a lot, we did that quite often. We just walk along, see a good looking area with nests, and sit down and w- just watch. Mm-hmm. And then give it a half hour. And then, but the thing is, too, we had going for us, we'd hunted those woods so often, we kind of knew the best places to go. Right. And mm-hmm. this is your first time ever in, into that property. So, yeah. yeah. It was yeah, a cool little piece. Yeah. It was. Yeah. All those rock outcroppings down here in southern Wisconsin is, is pretty sweet. You keep bringing up things that, that make so much sense when you say, like, it helps, you know, newer hunters in a lot of ways become better hunters overall when they start out maybe with a small game. Because, you know, you think you're doing a lot of the same things. You have to exercise patience. You have to exercise, you know, looking for things like squirrel nests, mm-hmm. understanding what might be a nice habitat for them to be in. And then, too, the other thing is, you got to be able to put a shot on a squirrel. It's not a 
very large target. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, to be able to do that, I would say most squirrels are probably smaller than the vitals on a, a deer. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you can if you can pinpoint a shot on a squirrel, you're you're doing all right. Yeah. Well, I remember um, my ninth grade algebra algebra teacher. He liked to hunt squirrels. I remember one time one of the kids got talking in, in class about how they lost a squirrel that weekend. You know, they, they shot it and got back in its hole, and, and they could see it had died inside the hole. One kid, you know, you know, kids can climb anything, and they shinned up the tree and reached in, retrieved the squirrel. And I remember that teacher getting kind of not just, you know, he was pissed. He said, do, huh. do you people not have a heart? Why don't you shoot for the head? Why didn't you shoot them in the head? <laughs> and and I and I started thinking about that, and that's kind of I um typically either if I couldn't get a head shot, I'd always go for the lung shot. Okay, right. And I, now that drops them real fast, but yeah, they they don't always drop right in the spot though. But they oftentimes don't go very far. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't don't have the power to go all the way up the tree and then you know crawl in the hole and die. But, but I remember that teacher's anger and irritation that they were. Plus, they're talking about it publicly like that in the class. Right. Yeah, I'd say probably that's, you know, going back to, I think that's one of the differences between Madison schools back then and now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't oh, think that conversation oh, happens you know, in Madison. Yeah. yeah the, the, a lot of these teachers we had back then, they'd ask the kids going into deer season, how many guys are going deer hunting this weekend? Oh, yeah. You know, and well, up in Wapaka, where I'm from now, I mean, I've been living up there 25 years, and my, when my girls were in high school, I'm sure it's still this way today that, you know, they... It's not assumed the kid's going to take off during deer season for a couple of days, but they give that opportunity that if you're with your parents and the parents are okay with it and they give a little note that, yeah, you, you, you're not coming to school on that Friday and then stay yeah. gone the, you know, the rest of the week. And, That's awesome that yeah, they that still awesome. foster that yeah. tradition up there. Yeah, and when I hear some stories about people that couldn't, couldn't go deer hunting because their kid had choir practice or something, I'm always skeptical. Yeah. I, I always think in Wisconsin... I don't know, maybe in, in Madison, maybe in Milwaukee, but most of rural Wisconsin, the rural communities, I don't know if a teacher could get away with holding choir practice on a Saturday during deer season and mm. expecting kids to show up for it. I, so when I hear those kind of things, I, I want to call it BS on a thing. If you don't want to go deer hunting with us, just say so. <laughs> don't, <laughs> yeah. don't hide behind your kid's <laughs> teacher, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's a few things in Wisconsin you don't schedule over. Packers games, deer season, and I think that's it. Those yeah. are the only two things I'm aware of. Yeah. That's really all I can yeah. think of. And I think deer season, even more than Packer games, they play more than one game a year. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. So deer season is really, um, that's, that's important stuff. For sure. Yeah. So what, what have you seen kind of like evolving with the land situation as far as we are hunting on public land today? Mm-hmm. I'm just curious, you know, You've been talking about a lot of the squirrel hunting and things and, and hunting that you used to do. Was that most of what you did back on public land then, or has um, have you seen like more or less availability? And you know, I think one one fallacy that I often talk about is this idea that that you could just go anywhere you wanted when I was a kid. And I thought, no, you you really couldn't. You didn't get get questioned as much. I mean, today when you think about, it, you know, you get nailed on. Somebody come out and chase you off, but you still. I remember going to some private property without permission back in the early 70s. It was typically in areas where you kind of knew who, you kind of knew some of the people in the area. Mm -hmm. So you at least say, well, I'm I'm Jim Watts' nephew or something like that, even if Jim didn't live for another half mile down the road. Mm -hmm. At least they had some, you know, familiarity that way. So that was kind of how we got onto some land during small game season. And I remember one time knocking on a farmer's door and talking to his wife, and, and she was an older lady, and, and it was like about a month before a deer season, you want to go squirrel hunting. Mm-hmm. And, she, and she was kind of reluctant, but then she says, well, we like to keep things quiet in the woods before deer season, but it's still a month away, so go ahead. You mm-hmm. know? And so we walked back there, and she, but they wouldn't let us, the same farm that would not let us bow hunt there, because they wanted to leave the deer alone. Mm-hmm. You know, but they let you squirrel hunt. And, and, but then deer hunting, though, was, even back then, it was very hard to get on the private land. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you walked into someone's private land during deer season opening day and you didn't have permission to be there, chances are there's going to be somebody around very quickly who owns that land to throw you off. It just, I mean, the, the people trespassed a lot more commonly back then, but you got chased off land pretty quickly usually. And that was my experience anyway. Yeah. I tell you, it's a scary thing sometimes. You've been chased off a few times, Pat? I never was. <laughs> you know, I, no, actually I was because I, I followed a friend of mine down by um, Rena. And I remember Steve said we had permission to be in this one farm. 
Well, but, but I didn't know that Steve wasn't too familiar with the property line, so we walked in the dark, and a little bit later I heard, it was still in the dark, and I remember, I remember hearing this loud discussion going on just on the ridge from me. A little bit later, the little flashlight comes back to the woods, and Steve says, we got to get out of here. This is, we're not, you know, we cross that fence. This mm-hmm. is this guy's land. You know, that's tricky. You think about that, though. I mean, like, that piece we were on today, like, you walk around, you caught, cross a few draws, go up this canyon, hit the creek. It'd be easy. You know, we have tools like Onyx now. Like, I was checking oh, that periodically. A- you know, okay, yeah, here, mm-hmm. here we're, we're on this ridge. Here's the boundary. I mean, you've got all that information in the palm of your hand. Yeah. I mean, without a hard fence line or sometimes even with the fence line, yeah. man, it's hard to know where and, you, and be, it, lines, I can see where that could happen very honestly. Yeah. And fence know? lines aren't as common now as they were, you know, a generation ago. I mean, people just don't, like we were talking about earlier, people don't fence their, their wood lots like they used to. So many fence lines now are all broken down because there's no cows in there anymore. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Is that because they're not running cattle yeah, in there? Yeah, they aren't running the dairy cows in there, and mm. so there's no, no need for it. I know like in my uncle's land where I've hunted since um, the early 80s, they haven't maintained their fences in, God, I mean, the boundary fences. Yeah. They, they have internal fences where they used to have some beef cattle. Out in the boundary of the property, and those haven't been, in the time I've been hunting there, they might have rerun some barbed yeah. wire once or twice, but then once a tree falls on and they get to the point, well, why, why fix it all up again? Yeah. We don't have any cattle up there anymore. So I think that's become a lot more common. I feel like it's such a common sight, yeah, to see run down fences. I almost just, I usually just sort of, if I feel like I'm coming up on what looks kind of like a property line, sometimes you can see a tree line that, that looks yep. a little bit yep. too unnatural. Yep. You know, you can look and usually there's some, some stakes in the ground with some barbed wire down. Yeah. You're like, yeah, 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 I'm just going to assume that's a line. Yeah. No, that's true. Like you, I, I'm like recounting all the fences I've run into and yeah, most of them well, are that, pretty dilapidated. That onyx is a game changer. It's just, I mean, a number of times now, just in the one or two years I've had that, I'll be someplace. Like, I, I took part in an urban bow hunt this past winter up, up in Wapaka. They had, like, maybe 10, 12 tags given out to, uh, I think, maybe a dozen of us. Yeah. And they had specific city properties I could hunt on. And I remember getting on the edge of the one and thinking, I know there's a private boundary here somewhere. I just figured out the onyx. I realized, oh, I ran the edge of the right, right now. So mm-hmm. I, I backed back into the city property. And I thought, and that's just amazing, this magical thing that you can hold in your hand and know where you're standing and who owns that land and and stay out of trouble, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Pretty handy tool. Yeah. We talk about it all the time. I feel like we're like, it's like some sales pitch all the time, but we just use it so much. That Yeah. And Eric now, since the last podcast that we were on, turned us on to Google Maps, which has been there for a long time, and they have the ability to uh, show you where the shade is. During the day, what was it that? What was oh, it yeah, yeah. again? I can't. I don't remember. It's uh, Earth, Google Earth. Oh, not Maps. Sorry, Google Earth. Thanks, MC Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was. A, it was a feature can... on Google Earth where you could essentially, you know, almost like manually, you know, slider bar track, track the sun. And so he was using it to kind of pick out likely bedding at, as yeah. as deer might yeah, be changing, find... you know, where they want to lay throughout the day. Wow. Which is I, I haven't tried that. Pretty wild. I didn't even know you could do that. Yeah, I didn't know that was a thing, but it's, it's a thing. You need to check it out. Pat, you've got three girls, mm-hmm. and how many of them hunt? All of them hunt, or some no, of them d- hunt? just the oldest one hunts. Okay. Yeah. she. I took all three of them. I, I tried my little indoctrination program, and all three of them were basically at around age three. I'd start t- taking them along um, goose hunting. Because mm-hmm. goose hunting, I haven't done it now for a number of years, but back in the, well, this is back in the late 80s, early 90s, there's enough geese, and I knew we were going to find the geese, and I'd take the girls and explain to them, Yeah, because at age three, you can start getting some basic stuff across to them, mm-hmm. and they have good ears, and little kids have dynamite ears, and when they, they get that reward where um, you tell them, listen for the geese, and when you see them or hear them, you know, let me know. Okay. And my oldest daughter especially is like watching a little radar, you know, you know set up, she'd be real alert, and then her little head would start turning, and then just almost like a pointing dog, she'd start locking in. And when she saw him, it's funny how quickly kids learn all those little tricks that hunters learn with time, how to pick out geese at a distance and not confuse them with like a blackbird flock closer to you. All these little things that hmm. at first they get, they get tricked, you know, like, oh, mm-hmm. there's, there's some birds. And no, those are, those are just blackbirds. And, you know, and once they start seeing the geese, the little, the little heads start working. And Leah especially had that knack. 
you know, she had the interest. Mm -hmm. And I think I told the story on Renella's podcast about where, when I knew which of the girls was the hunters and who were not. And it was when I was goose hunting where when the geese would start working, you'd call to them and they'd start dropping into your decoys. And when they start getting in the range and they're tilting down, it's just this cool experience. You know, anyone who's hunting geese knows when they start start tilting and rocking and they're coming into the decoys, the fun's about to happen, you know. Well, my daughter Leah, when that would happen, her eyes would be up. And she was this excitement in her, in her eyes. You just see it. Mm-hmm. And I remember one time seeing that. I know I'm getting ready to pick, get up and shoot. I look over. Leah's excited. Her eyes are up. There are two heads down <laughs> and they're, they're covering up their ears because <laughs> it was about to get <laughs> gnarly, about, get, about to get loud, and, and in that flash, you know how fast your brain processes thoughts. I remember in that little quick look, I realized hunter, not hunters, you know, <laughs> just like that. And but, but the thing is, they, they still went along. I always think that's still a good good experience for them. That sometimes being dragged along against maybe against your will, even to at least experience it, see why it matters to your dad, and see why it matters to your sister. It's kind of a good thing to know as you get older and yeah, you at share least it with be people. able to appreciate it. Yeah. And it is a, in the geese, it's a pretty sound. It's a pretty environment you're hunting in usually. And Wisconsin, you know, we're lucky we have those kind of, all these different things to hunt and different places we can go on. Typically farmers for, for goose hunting, you know, if you just ask around, you know, typically mm-hmm. you find a place to hunt. You probably still could today. I just don't, I, I just found that I don't have so much time in the day anymore, but I just don't hunt geese like I used to. And yep. now I, when I have time, I'll, I'll go out west and hunt elk for two weeks. And then when I do that, though, I have to come back and make up for it because I'm a freelancer. Mm-hmm. There's no one working for me when I'm gone, so I got to come back and make up that time. And so you don't get these um, nice block weekends to go out and do stuff anymore. I often am working through weekends. Yeah. D- different times, different expectations. Yeah, you, you brought up the you know, doing the Meat Eater Live podcast, which uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the panel with you. And so when I got back from that event, I asked my wife, you know, this is the day after, whenever they whenever they posted it, you know, mm-hmm. and she listened, I'm like, ah, what'd you think? She goes, oh man, that's great. I really like that Pat Durkin guy. He's my favorite. Really? Yeah. Well, that's, that's nice to hear. So yeah, kudos to you, Pat. I, I was expecting, you know, <laughs> may, maybe... Maybe just even through obligation that I might take like a, that hey, title. Hey, good job, Mark. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, there well, wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of talk about well, me. Well, I think one of my biggest laughs of the night though was when you had that line about um, world's okayest hunter. You want a T-shirt that says oh, yeah. "World World's Okayest Hunter." I, I hadn't heard that before. That was that was a clever line. I can't I can't take credit for that one, but I mean that's it goes even like today. And that, part of that is I've just lived a very big game centric life. Yeah. And I yeah. love doing a wide variety of things and seeing new landscapes and new places. You know, hunted moose for the first time in my life with some buddies sure. this fall. Yeah. Don't claim to be a professional moose hunter, but it was a heck of a good time. And I learned a lot, mm-hmm. you know, and just like today, it's like, don't claim to be a professional squirrel hunter, but I learned a lot. And I yeah. can tell you this, yeah. I plan on learning a lot more. You can mm-hmm. get made to look silly, even when you've been doing all that experience that you've had. Yeah. Mark, have you uh, taken your daughters out hunting yet? Not yet, you know, and I was I was thinking about that this year. We've done a little bit of fishing. They enjoy it. They asked to go. We we're uh, doing some yard work the other day. I'm sidetracking, but it warmed my heart. You know, we're pulling some shrubs out, and the girls were, without prompting, digging for worms, holding worms. You know, Mara started a worm bucket. She wanted you know keep them for the rest of her life. She got mad when I put. I'm like, hey, they need a little dirt on them. She didn't want to put the dirt on them because then she couldn't see them. But um. <laughs> So, yeah, so we've done some fishing, and I, I started to think about that really this year when the, uh, when the youth hunt kind of came and went, mm-hmm. you know? And I thought to myself, wow, I really I could have taken my girls or one of my girls out, uh, Mars four and a half, and Avery's three. And I wasn't sure, well, number one, it was a deer hunt. And just like we're talking, that, that's a really big thing to start out with, particularly if, you know, if you're younger. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to think of, like, when, when is that first time to actually, you know, take them deer hunting when they can actually shoot or maybe hunting in general? And I don't think we're there yet. And I think kind of like what you're talking about, Pat, like, I think I just need to take them with me. Yeah. Yeah. I used to always take them scouting, you know, for deer. Yeah. And that's where um, I remember going up to, the, up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I used to hunt there a lot from for about 10 years. I go up to hunt the, the gun season up in the UP every year up in... Houghton County, which is just beneath the Keweenaw Peninsula. 
and it was a big woods environment. And so I'd, I'd take them up there and they were just, I remember that my youngest one was, at the time was three years old. And I remember one thing good about scouting, you're not going to ever be in a big rush to get everybody dressed and sitting in that stand and then cooping them up in that stand for that long time. You're always moving. Yeah. And then while you're out moving around with them and scouting, you can explain stuff to them. And that's fun too, to see what interests them. The thing that I think I, I still laugh about, because I, I think it makes sense because it's something they can understand. Deer pellets, rabbit pellets, when you found like the occasional, not in the UP, but other places I've t- took them up way up to Minnesota, uh, moose pellets. Yep. Anything that comes out of an animal's butt, little <laughs> kids, there's something fascinating about that. And why that would be, I have no idea, but there's something that interests them. And so those kind of stories that I always find, uh, yep. you, know, you try to pay attention to what they find fun and then you know work on that. I think that must be a universal truth with kids because we've gone on, on a handful of nature walks. Uh, that's what we call them, nature walks, you yeah. know, go, go in the woods. And, you know, we find deer tracks and, and the deer poop. And, yeah, that's always the most fascinating. And the last one we went on, you know, Mar, it, and it's amazing. They find it themselves. You yeah. know, at first it's what's this, you know, now at least Mar, she, she knows what it is. And I asked her at the end of it, I said, so what was your favorite? You know, we found a rub and we found deer tracks and uh, walked around and whatever. And I asked her what her favorite part was. And, and it was uh, unequivocally the deer poop. <laughs> the deer poop. Yeah. <laughs> like there, there was no hesitation yeah. with that answer. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, when we take our dog outside, her favorite thing is rabbit poop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's a puppy. Yeah. She's a yeah. puppy. So it even goes across species. <laughs> but yeah. This is, yeah. A, this is not even a universal people truth. That's just truth. Just crazy. All, all those things with kids, though, I, I think that the parallel I make, too, with, with squirrel hunting and small game hunting is that it's much easier to get kids interested in things like perch or bluegills when you're catching them on a fairly regular basis, mm-hmm. where, you know, I would not take a kid out musky fishing and, right. and, and expect them to pick up on, on fishing. It's just, <laughs> you know, God, I, even as an adult, I really don't find musky fishing all that. I can do it maybe once or twice a year, and that's plenty for me. That's just my level of interest, you know. Yeah. And but yet I found that um with bluegills, if you find a good spot, you know, if they're catching this little things, the thing that I find really fascinating about little kids is they're wired into what I think keeps you alive. They are not into catch and release. They're into catch and eat. Yeah. You know, and, and it can be a bluegill that big, they do not want to give it back to the water. You know, yeah. They, they want to keep it. But still I'd, I'd always compromise and keep a few. But when that little is just so much a pain to clean up. But I found that fascinating that you try to teach them all, you know, you want to eat the ones that are bigger and throw back the little ones and they just not, they're not having it. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, that concept does, the, yeah. No, no mercy. Like, yeah. I yeah. caught it. No, I no mercy is, is yeah. This, <laughs> this brings up an interesting point we were talking about earlier before we went on the squirrel hunt. So we're talking about like, cause that almost seems like an innate human reaction to catching something that is really mm-hmm. food. And we were talking about the fact how it's crazy when you walk into a grocery store these days. Hmm. And the, I guess the more I've worked around, around Vortex and just in this industry, I've started to notice this more. Every time I go in the grocery store, I think to myself, there's food just laying out here. And there's a bunch of other people here. We are in close proximity to one another, but we're all just ignoring each other, grabbing food. And then we go and wait in line next to each other and then purchase the food and go home. Mm-hmm. It's like, so not primitive, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. it's totally normal. Mm-hmm. It's wild. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and there's no, you know, there's different, you know, hungry people in the world and, you know, in the United States or whatever, but just the, the availability, you know, and the access is really a very human thing to have it be like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you said that, it made me think how um, I feel like I was lucky it wasn't something my parents planned or my grandmother planned, but. My dad's mother lived with us from the time I was like um, seven years old. And I think even by that time in our, in our country's progressions and evolution, even by the you know, mid-60s, of the, of, you know, 1960s, it wasn't that common for a grandparent to live with one of the kids' families. I mean, it was common before then, mm-hmm. generation before then, but for our, our grandmother to be living with us, the thing that was, I found later, looking back on, was really helpful for me in life was hearing her stories and her encouragement about hunting and fishing. Because she, she raised four kids to the Depression kind of on her own because, you know, my grandfather was, was an alcoholic and she 
pretty much told him to get out of the house when he's like that. So he mm-hmm. wasn't always around. And so she raised these four kids, oftentimes without meat. Okay. And so once in a while, mm-hmm. when one of the kids would shoot a rabbit, it was a big deal. Right. And she was also, you know, she was born in 1898. And so she remembered growing up that um, how scarce meat could be, even though she lived on, on a small farm. Just didn't have the capability of that farm the size of it to, to raise a whole lot of animals. Mm-hmm. So you'd raise what that little farm could, could support, but then you couldn't go out and kill a, a sheep once a week or something, whatever it might be. Yeah, right. You know, you had to make that last. And so she'd talk about how her brother would shoot a rabbit every now and then or a squirrel would come home with some bullheads, mm-hmm. you know, from the Lake Mendota over, over there. And, and that was a big deal. And I think, you know, to get to your point, we really don't realize what a rich society we live in mm-hmm. until you start, that wasn't that long ago that we weren't quite that, that wealthy as a society where you have people, you know, the middle, there really wasn't a middle class. It was, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of people just didn't have much means. Yeah. There, there wasn't grocery stores of that kind of abundance. Yeah. And, and that could very well be something that goes into also people talk about the lower rate of hunter recruitment these days, or I guess, lowering hunter numbers these days and there's less of a need for subsistence right off hunting it's it's more yeah there's definitely a strong for the people who do engage you know recreational component or you know right. and even for me it's like it's more of a a supplement to my diet you mm-hmm. know it's the food that means the most to me when i yeah. eat it and it's the yeah. food i'm most proud of and it's the food that i want to share and i'm like you know happy to share because you know, there is that satisfaction of, of just everything that went into procuring it, and you have a story to tell with this it. This whole week, the office has been thrilled with the venison sticks that you brought in. There huh. you go. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And, and I love... And like, it's been a, the main topic of conversation because you brought in very many. Yeah. And, you know... And, you, and we all love them. And, and when people say, yeah. oh, this tastes so good, and I didn't make them, you know, so I can't take credit for how they <laughs> taste, you know, right, but I can take right. credit for at least whatever the portion of those sticks that is deer that, you know, made yeah. it made it into them. But there's there's a pride that like makes you feel good. And had I brought in some, you know, sticks that I just, you know, bought from the store, you know, from the gas station, like none of that would be there. Like it'd be completely absent, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or, if, or if I had you guys over for a T-bone steak dinner, it'd be great company. We'd have a great time. We'd enjoy right. a nice meal. But... There'd be there, something... There's not the connection. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know, I remember um, talking about this with Steve on this podcast, but it was an article I wrote about that caught his interest before he really knew me very well, talking about Steve Ranella. Um, it was an article I wrote about the whole system in our country that we cannot sell the meat from game we shoot. Mm-hmm. You can't, right. You can't take venison steaks down to the meat market and then barter and, and sell them. But over in Europe, where it's all basically private, everything, the uh, wildlife is privately owned, they can go down to the, the, the meat market and trade in meat, be reimbursed for it. Then it's sold to other people, you know, right, right there on the streets of Stockholm, whatever it might be, in, in Sweden. And you go down to Italy. I remember where I got the idea for the story was I was eating at a, just my, when my oldest daughter was in the Navy, we, she was stationed over in Italy for a while. So we, we met her in uh, Florence, went to this nice restaurant, and I was reading the menu, and I said, during the hunting season and it gave the months, the wild boar is, is freshly shot, you know, within the previous days, you know, basically. Okay. Wow. And then the, the off season, it's um, frozen, but it's all locally produced, basically, you know, uh-huh. hun- hunted. And, and I thought, well, that's cool. You know, you can do that. But then again, you get in the, the trade-off, though, is that, well, but it is privately owned stuff. It's not publicly owned. We don't, in right. our country, it's all publicly owned. So you yep. can't just go out and do that. But those kind of things, though, I guess my whole point where I bring that up is because the people in Sweden, the, the ones I was most familiar with from having a friend that lives in Sweden most of the year, they really, really value that moose meat because they know when they go in the store and they see the price of it, it's a lot more than beef. You need to buy that, that um, locally produced, locally shot, harvested uh, meat that was brought in by a hunter. And so they pay a, a premium for that kind of meat. So when someone... Mm-hmm brings it home and gives it to them as a, as a gift, like we would give flowers to your neighbor, whatever it might be, they really value it because they, they can think in monetary terms about it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah. that is really interesting because I feel like certainly people here in the U.S., when somebody brings over like a venison roast, I mean, they, it, there's an appreciation and probably even more so appreciation than you brought over just something you got at the grocery store, you know. But yeah, to be able to put almost like a like a monetary value on it, you know, or or just like understand... 
the value of it. There is some non monetary value, of course, mm-hmm. being, right? Being that there's there's a lot of that that goes on with the hunt. Yeah, there's like a direct monetary comparison between like you know maybe some moose meat that I shot myself and moose meat that you could buy at the store, yeah. which seems like that's which just is like also a, shot by somebody else. Right, totally foreign concept to me. <laughs> But, you know, and it's funny, I think Steve and those guys were talking about almost a related subject on their podcast, you know, and I think they brought, like, morels as an oh, example. Yeah, right, right. Where I think they were talking about morels and also shed antlers, mm-hmm. you know. Or back in the day, maybe somebody would, you know, pick up a shed antler, or, or you know, if you're out, you're, you, know, you pick some morels. But kind of over time, it got more popular, and they, they gained a lot of value. Mm-hmm. And so now it's more desire maybe a person who maybe would have passed it by or not really thought of it or or pursued it now they are because right. all, all of a sudden now there's where, a monetary value now it has value where yeah. before it didn't yeah yeah, yeah before it was just a cool thing to have and now it's now they actually put a price tag on it and, and that was an interesting discussion yeah because then over there too like where you're talking about in sweden like when somebody shoots a moose do they just see dollar signs or do they i don't think so no so no much? um no, I don't think that really happens. I think the guy who shoots it still understands this is pretty, yeah. pretty neat meat. And this is pretty cool stuff to have. Yeah. It's not something you can get in the store. And so they still value it. But they also know that when they do take it over to the neighbors, the value is uh, maintained. Understood. That the person still, they, they know that you're giving something that's of high value to them. I don't think they're, you know, that I was asking these guys that, those kind of questions, you know, how much do you actually sell? And well, it gets down to it. They don't, they don't sell too much of it because... They want it themselves. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you know. I would. And, and, then, and then they share it among their friends. Like, like you know, you guys know when you shoot a, something like an elk or a, or a moose, it's rare for one family to be able to consume that much meat in, in a year. I mean, some, some people can, but not, not everyone can. Mm-hmm. So I know like in our family, though, when I was, when I was um, raising our three da- daughters, I never hunted elk or moose back in those days. And I still haven't hunted moose. But um, this is the days in the 90s where um, Wisconsin, you could basically go out starting back then, and shoot all the deer you wanted. Just how much do you really want? So it was common for me to end up shooting, you know, five, six deer a year. We could cut them up ourselves, and mm-hmm. we'd, that was our meat for the year, basically. We really, the only other meat we'd buy once in a while would be chicken. And although the family's dispersed, we're empty nesters, and when I bring home elk or deer now, I still spread it around to the girls, but it's not as handy as it used to be where you'd be making it for meals all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. harder hard to go through all that kind of meat now. It is, yeah. But it's also really nice to share it. Oh, it's it's still valued. You yeah. know, I think you never lose that. And I, Plus, I like to think that when they get something from the old man, it still means something to them. Yep. And in our family, family I always find it kind of interesting that I raised three daughters, and none of them married a hunter. And I still like them all. I still love them all. But I think, yeah, it's just, yeah I worry about the hunting culture dying with me, basically. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. Know, and because one thing I found about... um. My daughter, Leah, when she's deer hunting with me, you won't find a more dedicated hunter. She'll sit on that stand, dawn to dusk, not give up, mm-hmm. real, real hardcore that way. But she will not go out and hunt on her own. Okay. I don't think she's ever done that where she'd just pack the car mm-hmm. and drive somewhere. Of course, now that she's um, away anyway, she's in the Navy and has, a, has her own family and little kids to take care of. Mm-hmm. Husband doesn't hunt, so she doesn't go hunting unless um, I find a way to get her out there. So, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask if she's taken her kids at all, but... You know, it's it's interesting. She hasn't, but they're, they're not old enough yet. Her oldest boy is only two and a half. Oh, okay, yeah. One of the things I find fun now as a, as a grandfather is that even though my two younger daughters, my middle daughter and my youngest daughter, they have little kids now. I have, I have, I have six grandkids, two for each daughter, and each daughter has a boy and a girl. And they're all like between the ages of six months right now and, and, and four years. And what I find fun about this, and I haven't even been able to do it yet, but they're all making these overtures to me now that when their kids are old enough to tag along, they want me to teach them how to hunt and fish and get them out in the boat and get them out in the field and that kind of thing. And that makes me feel really good because I've often wondered over the years, I always thought, I like to think I was doing a good thing, taking the kids hunting and fishing when they're youngsters. And I took them fishing all through their high school years, too, because mm-hmm. they get all fish. Mm-hmm. Hunting was just wasn't something that really tripped their trigger for, for the younger two. But now, like I said, now I have these grandkids coming along, and you realize that they're not doing this, they're not making these comments to me 
and requests of me to keep this in mind to take their kids fishing and hunting down the road, they aren't doing it just to keep me busy. Because mm-hmm. I, I don't have a, I keep myself pretty busy. Right. <laughs> and so I like, like to think that my daughters are, are thinking about it enough to where this has made an impression on them. They don't want their kids to grow up without that knowledge, without that experience. Right. So it, that, that's really, to me, very satisfying. I, I take a lot of pride in that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to those days when I can get them out in my, I, I built a rowboat years ago out of cedar planks and their cedar strips. And so I, I do mostly rowing now when I go fishing. But I, I like doing these kind of things with kids where you can, you know, go out and make those kind of connections. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. That's kind of, that's a really interesting, you know, factor, whatever that, you know, obviously those experiences that they had with you hunting and fishing, it sounds like, you know, they still fish a little bit, but, you know, like you said, the, the two never really, you know, the hunting didn't stick with them, you know, mm-hmm. as far as them, you know, taking it up and making it, you know, kind of a part of their adult lives. But they were important enough that they want their children to experience yeah, yeah, they obviously resonated. Things. Yeah, I, I think that you know, in many ways, you don't have to like just appreciating hunting. You don't have to like go out and do it all the time or, or constantly be in hunting right. in order to just appreciate it. And at least you know if if that appreciation is being passed on, I think that that's a positive thing. I'll even be the first to admit myself that there are many times where I could have gone hunting, but I just have I do have other interests too. Right, you mm-hmm. know. But I'll be the first person also to stand up for hunting if that was ever necessary yeah. you know yeah. because i do appreciate it and i understand that you know a lot of other people do too yeah 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 i, I always like the idea of make this pitch quite often about just being good ambassadors not being jerks about it, not being defensive about it. just this is something we enjoy there's a if you give me a chance to, to explain to you the values of these things and why they're important to me i think you might come away with a little different perspective but um when, when you run the people though who really just have their minds closed to it I'm not going to start and argue with them and try to convince them because I just think it's, you know. But, but I really do believe most people I've met in my life, when they hear I'm an outdoor writer, they'll start you know, curious, like, oh, I never met an outdoor writer before. And what, what's that? You know, and, and you start telling them, well, basically hunting and fishing. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I explain, well, they'll ask about, well, do you, do you go hiking and camping? I said, for the purpose of hunting and fishing. <laughs> you know, I, right. I, I don't, like today we're walking around the woods. I wouldn't walk around that woods just to go hiking through it. Right. I've, tr- oh, yeah. I've tried that. I've tried going on these different hikes for um, just to go out and hike from point A to point B. It doesn't interest me. You know, like I, I run. I, I run for fitness and I run for um, various, you know, races and stuff. And I enjoy that. But I always say, I'm not really enjoying it while I'm doing it. Right. I, but I know physically it really benefits me down the road and makes my hunting a little more enjoyable when you're in good enough health, good enough shape yep. to walk up and down these ridges like we were today and those kind of things that, you know, we shouldn't take that for granted. And those things, though, you know, very easily in life just get so sedentary that it is hard to walk around just a little bit we did today. Yep. And so, but I never understood the, the appeal of going out and pitching a tent just to, just to go, go camping by itself. It doesn't interest me. I choose to believe that people do that because they just haven't figured, they haven't found hunting yet. And then once they do, then they'll realize that it's just a... Well, well it's just a, they can still go in a tent. That's yeah. the thing. You can still go in a tent. And then while you're there, why not go shoot a squirrel or two? And then, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it can be part. It made me think too, you know, my wife is New Jersey born and bred. That's where, you know, she's from, grew up right outside New York City, basically. And until she met me, she never knew a hunter or fisherman firsthand, you know. But I, one of the things I remember that it made an impression on me that I've never forgotten, I took her fishing. I had um, built a, an old, four, I built a 14-foot John boat out of, out of plywood and fiberglass when I was mm-hmm. in the Navy. And I got an engine for it, and I, a few months later, I met Penny, started taking her along and that kind of stuff. I always remember taking her down to a place called Back Bay, Virginia, it's down in, in the basically the brackish water between the ocean and, and the fresh water on the coast down there. And nice bass fishing, largemouth bass fishing. I remember the first time I hauled in a bass, and she netted it. And when we got that fish in the boat, I still remember her pounding my back with excitement, <laughs> just whacking me. She's so excited. Yeah. And I thought, this is a girl, never grew up around fishing, never grew up around hunting, didn't really know really anything about it until she met me. But the excitement of that fish fighting up on, up on top of the water and diving down underneath the boat and coming back up and flashing again and going back down and, 
And then the excitement of trying to get that thing close enough to the boat and then telling her, put the net in the water, get it down about six inches below the, the surface. And when I bring it over the top, scoop. Oh, the excitement was just, it was so, it was so visceral, so real. You know, you knew that was, this wasn't just going through the motions, excitement. She was pumped. Right. And I That's think awesome. now how many things, how many things can we do in life that sparked that kind of instant adrenaline like that? And not many things can do that, you know? And hunting and fishing do it, though. That, that strike, even when you're out trolling and a downrigger pops in on salmon or something, God, that's fun. Oh, man. Totally had it today when that squirrel all of a sudden jumped up out of nowhere. All of a sudden, I forgot that I was with you guys because I remember I was the one who saw him. Right. And I just ran after him, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I don't even know where they are anymore. <laughs> I yeah, Mark, yeah, Mark came over and wanted to know where you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was I was just riding the adrenaline. I was the one so with the map. Right. I figured I better, you know. I started. I turned around. And I started doing like my, yeah, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yip 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 yip. <laughs> no, I think I think you nailed something there, Pat. You know, I mean, like, and I can't remember. I think you know, bring it up all the time. I think somebody on the meter podcast actually even might have been when when we were chatting up in mini, but talking about it as like almost this ancient rewards system, you know, or maybe that was even I can't remember where I heard it, but I can't take credit for it. And I was like, man, that is it. I mean, that it is something innate. It's built into you that when you see that deer or when that fish strikes or, you know, whatever, you know, quarry, if you will, that you're going after, when that starts to go down, I mean, it is, is like you said, just visceral, exciting, mm -hmm. just you know, the, the world slows down. It's, all, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it's I, really indescribable. I, I've had these discussions with, with folks where um, I had a photographer one time try to tell me that the, the excitement he gets of getting a good photograph equals that adrenaline rush. And I, I didn't buy it. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, just, I said, Bill, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I shoot a lot of photographs, but I, I don't pretend to be a professional photographer though. Right. So, so I can't say I know for certain what he's feeling but I have a hard time buying it. There's something about um, that connection. I think it is a food connection too. Mm -hmm. It's that, very primal. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very primal. And I, there's something about um, the connection I can make here where I think I'm making a solid scientific argument is that I think it was Stanley Temple is the guy's name or one of these, he's a, prof he's a retired professor now but from the University of Wisconsin over here in Madison. I think it was Temple or some other one of these ornithologists over there. He took... A heart monitor, this had to be like 25, 30 years ago. He took mm -hmm. these tiny little heart monitors and strapped it to a, a hawk, I think it was, and then monitored its heartbeat. Okay. And learned real quickly that when that hawk would see potential prey, would get this adrenaline spike. It'd oh, be yeah. something that was just instantly would be up there. And then it'd make its assessment. And if its judgment was that this is prey I can get, its heart rate would stay up there. And just be hammering. Wow! And then almost like it was getting the body prepped for the attack. Right. And then it would go. Where if the thing was a, a bird flying though in a certain way, whereas a bird that this hawk just knew no way I can get that, it would get that initial spike. Then the heart rate would go right back down. And then I think also about the same time, this um, rural sociologist who's become a friend of mine in recent years. He was monitoring hunter heartbeats to, to, for that kind of reaction. Okay, yeah. And he found in his research that the animal, the prey that jacked people's heart rate like nothing else was deer. Yeah. And that, you know, grouse jacked them up too when a grouse fl flushes. Well, that's mostly because that just scares the heck out yeah, of you. And that's part of it. <laughs> that, that is part of it, I'm sure. Whereas the deer tend to make that heart rate get up and stay up the longer, you know. So, so yeah. I think these are things that are hardwired in predators and yeah. Yeah, omnivores like us. So Well and you do here, I mean, you know, just about every year, which is an unfortunate thing, but you know, it seems like we lose a few hunters every year, you know, due to heart attacks on yeah. stand and you yeah. wonder if it's sure instigated by, you know, seeing a big buck or yeah. a deer or whatever and Well if that's if they have a heart condition or they're older and they haven't haven't taken care of themselves, whatever it might be. It's all sorts of varieties of, of yeah. heart problems that people have, and it might not take much to, you know, throw that ticker off and where it just stops, you know, yeah. who knows. Yeah. And I think part of that spike, too, or the adrenaline that comes with it is all the work and the time and the effort. Oh, the investment, yeah. Then the, the, yeah, the investment that goes in on the front end. You know, we keep bringing up, you know, talking about, you know, the little quick hunt we went on today. And, you know, had we uh, just kind of been shooting squirrels the whole time, it would have been, you know, 
it had been fun. We'd had some meat for the pot and had yeah. a nice, you know, great day together. But then all of a sudden you invest some time into it and oh, you know, yeah. it's a little limited and it's a little skinny out there. And all of a sudden, you know, it just, it has yeah. a little bit, like you said, you're, you're more invested yeah. in. Well, that's, that's a human thing. I think we're, um, it sounds like the English major as an English minor in college, but I just remember reading this Emily Dickinson poem in college. Success is kind of sweetest by those who never succeed. To comprehend the nectar requires sorest need. Now I think that makes so much sense to me. Oh, it does. That until you taste that and know what, what it tastes like, you can't comprehend how good it is. And then to not have it again, man, it motivates you. Yeah. You know, and I felt that way too. The squirrels, I think, I know I can feel that building again now. Yeah. That, that interest. Yeah. Those kind yep. of things. And, oh, yeah. And I, Mark and I were talking too for a little bit there today about um, a friend of mine turkey hunting. Turkey hunting frustrates him because he said, he says, you know, they're gobbling all the time, or not all the time, but they gobble enough to where they're almost taunting you. And then if you get one right away, he said that first one you get, it's kind of a, a good, wholesome experience. You're out there in the woods, you're hearing the, the birds chirping, the turkeys gobbling, a beautiful day, spring day. You kind of do it for the, this overall experience. And then you get a few under your belt and you start getting to the point where you shoot the next one because he deserved it. <laughs> you, get, you get so invested. You get so, so where, yeah, where, where this yep. shouldn't be this hard. Yep. This, you yep. know, these are not the brightest birds and there's enough of them around where this shouldn't be this hard. You know? <laughs> no, totally. You know, yeah. and I just oftentimes think too, like just like how exciting and, you know, like you said, that adrenaline that goes along with it. And I'm, it's not like I'm some sort of like adrenaline junkie. It's just like, you know, something that happens, yeah. you know. And I guess, you know, the whole thing wrapped up, it's something to where you think about it all year long, you plan all year long, yeah. your every schedule, every whatever you make, you know, oftentimes revolves around, you know, well, what hunting season is yeah. it, you know, this, that, the other. And like I said, I just, I wonder for folks that don't hunt, and this is probably sound bad, like I almost feel sorry for them because I'm not sure they have anything like that. Right. Like you said, like, you know, the, the guy taking the picture, that's awesome that he mm-hmm. loves taking a picture and, you know, but I just, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure. I, I really think we're, we're carnivorous yeah. beings. So there's something about, there's something about hunting for me that it's just different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If and, we were, yeah, if we were like herbivores, it probably wouldn't be that way. Yeah, probably. Oh, <laughs> right. Right. Well, I think too, because we are a thinking creature, you make all those connections. You start making those connections that, yeah, you know, things things do die f- for the benefit of others. And yes. But I think because we hunt, we are more aware of that. And I think the people who are vegans, there might be, they never quite take responsibility for the fact that, well, tilling a field, plant crops, that's Yee. not bloodless. That's a very bloody endeavor. You just don't see it, you know. But I, again, though, I, I always try to reel myself in on that because I think, well, you can't really expect them to understand that because it's not something that's part of their lifestyle. Yeah, It's not something that's in their background. They didn't grow up in a rural area, a lot of them. And, and so it's just, they've been detached from it. Yeah. So I guess if there's one thing I think I've learned over the years when it comes to the hunting and fishing issues is that you can't expect people who have never experienced those kind of things to understand it. But then, but then again, I've had that same thought, Mark. I do feel a little bit like, oh, I wish I could get more of these people out there like my wife that first time. To, it's almost uh, like, if you only knew. Yeah, if you if, only if you, knew. If you, if you would come out and see that, you wouldn't have to ask questions like, why do you have these stuffed animals in your house? Right. And Because you think, oh, I mean, when I was walking in your building today and saw these different animal mounts, mm-hmm. I thought, you know, maybe there will be a home for my all my different deer and stuff at some point you know, down the road when I'm gone. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do with all these heads now? But they'll never have the same significance to the people no. walking into a, another building as they will to me. Because mm-hmm. I can look up there and, boy, I can tell you, in most cases, the exact date right. when, when I killed that animal. I can, and I definitely can tell you the story behind it. And I think it's one of the things, things I always love about a, a nice shoulder mount is that the meat's long gone, been long consumed, but that, that mount's still there. Yep. And you get to be snobby about different taxidermists. And <laughs> I, I, I enjoy the, all that, that experience because... I tease the guy that does most of my taxidermy work. I said, you know, I have a doctor, I have a lawyer, I have a dentist, I have a taxidermist. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I, and the taxidermist is probably the one I've I've chosen the most carefully. Yep. Yeah. Like, you really don't have many choices when it comes to doctors and dentists. You kind of go to an office and where they, you kind of get paired up with those people over time, and it's not something you really consciously went out and sought though. 
Yep. And so I think, well, yeah, I, I kind of like the idea that I have a taxidermist that I, I've carefully chosen and winning them down from various people. And mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't say I've gone around the office here, you know, really analyzing people's smiles and, you know, you know, looking at their teeth and gums and then <laughs> and saying, you, you know, you know who, who you been going to, Jim? <laughs> you got pretty nice. Good, good, good point. I appreciate that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. What do you say? I, we've talked about a lot of good stuff here. Why, why don't we jump into last calls? And there's a lot to last call about. I know. I don't even know where to start. I was, I'll kick it off. I'll kick it off in that I thought it was just relating back to the small game hunting that we were talking about. I think that the word small maybe makes it seem like less of a big deal or, or makes it seem like something you take less seriously. However, after today, actually after all of my... Let's see, what was it? Dove hunting, hog hunting, squirrel hunting thus far. I'm going to take them a little more seriously. Yeah. From now on. No and, more uh, no more reindeer I games. I think it's worth it to take it more seriously because it is a legit, it's it's very fun, and it is a legit form of hunting that you're going to have to bring your A-game to. Yep. The one thing I was thinking about along that line, and I, I don't want to be the pessimist here, but you know that thought has crossed my mind a lot over the years. We were talking an hour ago about my wonder about where did all these deer come from all of a sudden, starting in the late 70s and through the 80s? Why, how did this population build the way it did in such a large area across North America? Then the thought would come then, well, what goes up has got to come down at some point. Yeah. So I would, I would ask different wildlife professors over the years, do you think the population could ever just crash? Because the way it built is it really built fast. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're talking about a decade, 15 years where it really boomed, and to the point now we're we're seeing some tail off because they've eaten the way even the woody vegetation a lot of these um, woodlands we live around in Wisconsin and Midwest and and so the habitat itself isn't there in the winter like it used to be to su- support these deer. And the answer I get quite often is that it has to come down at some point, but it probably won't come down as fast as it as it went up. Mm-hmm. And so I always think when we have these discussions of a small game. I, I think in the back of my mind I always think well. Whether we like it or not, someday we may be back in those days where if you really want to hunt on a regular basis, yeah, we might have to go back to small game and just find the enjoyment there. And I guess historically, I think there's enough of a biological hardwiring in this that I think um, when that time comes, I think small game will probably bounce back again. It probably never equal the level we have with deer right now. But I think I always think that the deer have always had this gnawing suspicion that we might be living on borrowed time there. That it's just something that happened. And the world changes, the ecosystems change. and But what's fun about that whole idea, though, is that, well, that wood duck that popped up today, that was an unexpected treat this morning. Oh, absolutely. It came out of nowhere. We were down that little valley looking for squirrels. Just a trickle of water down there. Yeah. And I think the water was coming down probably faster right now because of all the rain you've had. Mm-hmm. But still, who would have thought that wood duck be back in that squirrel woods where it was? But yeah. there it was. But I think that... Was fun. We didn't we didn't fire one shot. It wasn't even we had nothing to shoot at with. No, yeah. But it was, but it was just a cool thing to, to see. And so I think, yeah, I guess I'm not. When I think of all those things happening in my lifetime mm-hmm. and where it might be going after my lifetime, I think, well, somehow we'll find our way. Yeah, and we'll still find ways to have fun with in nature that are productive. So yeah. Well, well, yeah, you know, and I'll just you talk about that wood duck, and you know, when we're talking about earlier about you know things that bring you into what's like we wouldn't have been you know traipsing around the woods today together had we not had kind of the the focal point right. or, the, or the goal of chasing squirrels. Right. But an awesome byproduct of that that we all got to enjoy, you know, outside of, you know, the time together and kind of like, you know, the intent of, of the day was that, that wood duck. Like, never would have seen that wood duck in a million years had we not decided right. to go squirrel hunting today. Mm-hmm. And yep. yet, it was awesome. And I'll probably, yep. I'll probably remember that for the rest of my yeah. life. Well, you know, because when you hear a wood duck flushing, I mean, once you've heard one, you never forget that sound. But again, you just, you, your head swivels, you look, and it's kind of funny because I think Mark even instinctively started to raise your gun up. And I was like, what am I, <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah, you did. I looked over and I was like, uh, 10.22 on a wood duck? I was like, I don't. <laughs> it was a fun morning. Yeah. Great morning. Yeah, my last call is I think squirrel was the uh, the appropriate topic of the day because we covered a lot of topics and chased a lot of squirrels in this conversation and and a lot of good ones and uh, man, just awesome day, just awesome. just yeah. awesome, truly enjoyable day and yeah and thanks for know, having me down. Pat and I uh, 
we went out this morning. We went out to lunch. I actually, when we were eating lunch, I was like, I wish we were just recording this because we recorded like you know seven different podcasts while we we're at lunch today. Naturally. And uh, yeah, so just enjoyed the time, Pat, and Thank appreciate you. everything. And uh, you're just. An infinitely interesting person. Oh, thank you. Always enjoy <laughs> yeah. talking with you, and uh, thanks for coming down. Well, yeah, you bet. It's been fun. Alrighty, we'll uh, end it on a classic. Bye, 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 bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks everybody for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. Leave us a review or comment down below. We want to hear what you have to say about the show. Maybe what you like, maybe what you didn't like, so that way we can make these podcasts as good as they can be. You can also follow us on Instagram, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'll be posting about each episode released, so that way you can go back, find these things, maybe grab a little nugget of information that you can take with you to the range, out in the field, or uh, maybe to the kitchen if we're talking about some good food. So again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.